to go and get any more food or you're saving it up for a little bit later on. Have you enjoyed the food that you've had this weekend so far? Of course you have. So for those of you who have got no idea who I am, my name's Clara Hermit. I am a presenter for BBC Radio London and I've been vegan for four and a half years. And that's just one of the reasons why I'm here today. I like to think it's maybe because it's my job, but you never know. It could just be the fact that I'm vegan. So the next man that I'm going to welcome to the stage, we are incredibly lucky to have him here with us today. Um, he is the co-founder and president of the Farm Animal Rights Movement, which is America's oldest organization devoted exclusively to promoting the rights of animals not to be killed for food. He is the founder of World Day for Farm Animals, Meat Out, and the US National Animal Rights Conferences. He's writing a book about the history of US animal rights movement and the changing nature of vegan advocacy. Please give a massive, warm, vegan camp out welcome to Alex Hershaft. Thank you all so very much for this very warm reception. I have never spoken before this many people before, and certainly, <laughs> certainly not this many so lovely people as are in the Zoom today. So, the reason the human species has done so well in the past is because we are learning from our past tragedies. Uh, so for example, we, when we became aware of global warming, we started trying to cut back on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, when uh, we had major epidemics, we developed vaccines and antibiotics to take care of it. But if you look at uh, one of the biggest, most poignant tragedies of our modern era, the Holocaust of World War II, have we really learned any lessons? I'm not sure we have. And I'm so grateful to the organizers of this event because for the past 70 years, 7-0, I have been thinking about it and trying to figure out what is the lesson of the Holocaust. And I'm so grateful to the organizers of this event for allowing me to share my conclusion with you. So tomorrow, which is September 1st, uh, marks precisely 80 years since the Nazi armies invaded Poland and launched World War II. I was five years old. My dad was a chemist at the University of Warsaw. He was researching heavy water which is used as a critical component of nuclear reactions. Just before the war, he received a visa to continue his work in the United States, but he requested visas for me and my mom as well, and those visas unfortunately came too late. My mom was a mathematician, she, was, she also used her good looks and her cunning to keep my dad and me alive through most of the war. <laughs> After the invasion, we and about 400,000 other Jews in Warsaw and the surrounding areas were ordered to move into the Jewish section of Warsaw under penalty of death. Most had to move in with strangers, 
we were fortunate in that my grandparents had a large apartment and we were able to move in with them. Gradually, we noticed certain, certain pieces of walls going up and here and there. And eventually, on November 16, 1940, our area became the Warsaw Ghetto, one of Hitler's infamous concentration camps, designed to trap people while suitable mass killing facilities were getting built. Crowding and food shortages became unbearable. It is estimated that during the first year, between 80 and 100,000 people died of hunger and typhus epidemic. We did our best to cope with these hardships. Uh, there were workshops designed to uh, designed to uh, you know help people with their things. They were to manufacture and recycle clothing. Uh, there were uh, the goods were smuggled out and exchanged for food, which was smuggled in by children. On July 21, 1942, the Nazis launched their final solution, designed to murder all European Jews. Today, we refer to this murderous campaign as the Holocaust. In the next two months, they dragged some 300,000 people from their ghetto homes into jam-packed cattle cars for a trip to the Treblinka gas chambers. The key element of the operation was thorough deception to prevent a revolt of the victims. Uh, we were told that we were being resettled to the east, away from hunger and disease. We were told to mark our luggage carefully with our name and address in case we got separated. The, the Treblinka gas chamber was marked with the Star of David to simulate the synagogue and even the, the actual gas chamber itself was disguised as a shower. It is estimated that approximately 800,000 Jews were murdered in Treblinka and millions more in Auschwitz and other death camps. They left behind only piles of shoes, hair, glasses, and charred bones. Silent testimony to thousands of sentient beings who were no more. I am alive today because my grandparents had two crucial blessings, a substantial collection of gold jewelry and a Russian maid named Yuliana. Yuliana had been with them for many years. She spoke only Russian. And when we were forced to move into the ghetto, because she was not Jewish, she was not allowed to stay with us. But she had been a member of the White Russian Society in Warsaw, and the White Russians were being cultivated by the Nazis, so that when the Nazis took over Russia, they could be their puppets. So the White Russian Society was able to get 
Juliana special permits that allowed her not only to stay with us, but more importantly, to shop for food outside the ghetto and bring it in. That became our key to survival. We basically collected clothing and other durable goods from our friends and neighbors. Juliana would then strap these around her body, take them outside the ghetto, trade them for food, bring back the food, and then we would distribute the food to the people who gave us the goods. Uh, the mass roundups of 1942 proved too dangerous for Juliana, even with her permits. So my grandmother insisted that uh, Juliana had to leave to save her life. She agreed on only one condition, which was that she would take me with her as her son, so that so that I too would live. And So once we were on the outside, it was about a two and a half year ordeal of life in hiding. Always a life of constant alerts to any suspicious sounds, statements, or glances, and occasional close calls. My dad lived separately from us under a different name so that if one of us got caught, it wouldn't implicate the other. He never made it, and we don't even know how he died. My mom and I were liberated in 1945, and after five years of waiting for our visa in an Italian refugee camp, I immigrated to the United States in 1951, eventually got my PhD in chemistry, got married, and I have a lovely daughter. Once my survival was no longer a daily challenge, grief, guilt, and quest for meaning set in. Why was I spared when so many good people perished? How can I repay the debt for my survival? And finally, what is the lesson that we can learn from this terrible tragedy? In 1972, I moved to Washington to work for an environmental consulting firm. My first assignment was to conduct a wastewater inventory of a Midwestern slaughterhouse. As I was walking around, taking notes, I suddenly came across piles of hoofs and hearts, and heads, and discarded bodies, all bearing silent testimony to the sentient beings who were no more. I recalled in horror, as most of you would, uh, instantly images of human remains in death camps of Nazi Germany came to my mind. But I tried to dismiss it as mere coincidence. Ah, they're only animals, I kept repeating. But it didn't work. The images just would not go away. 
But after all, I was a scientist, or at least a budding scientist. And I knew there had to be an answer. I mean, everything has an answer. Something I was missing. Perhaps additional research would work. It didn't. As I continued my research, I noted more striking similarities between what the Nazis did to us and what we were doing to the animals. The skin branding or tattooing of serial numbers to identify the victims. The use of cattle cars to transport victims to their deaths. The crowding and housing of victims in wood crates. The arbitrary decision about who lives and who dies. The Christian lives, the Jew dies. The dog lives, the pig dies. The objectification and abuse of the victims to make the killing more acceptable. The callous, disrespectful dumping of the victim bodies in open pits. And finally, the deception about the horrors behind the death camp or slaughterhouse walls. My head was spinning, my world was turning upside down. If our treatment of animals bore any similarities to what the Nazis did to us, how could my enlightened American society sanction this? Did anyone else see what I was seeing? Was I losing touch with reality? Did I need psychiatric intervention? And then I saw a quote by Jewish Nobel laureate Isaac Bashevis Singer. He wrote, to the animals, all people are Nazis. To the animals, life is an eternal treblinka. At last, there was someone else who shared my version of reality. I was not losing my mind. This is when I knew that there may have been a valid reason for my surviving and a valid way to repay my debt to society. This is when I resolved to devote the rest of my life to fighting all forms of oppression, starting with our own society's oppression of animals for food. Some of us in the Warsaw Ghetto would comfort ourselves with the mantra, never again, meaning that the world would be so shocked by our supreme sacrifice that we would never again allow such atrocities to take place. Unfortunately, it didn't work that way. Uh, tragically, never again became again and again as many more mass killings followed. A key question facing historians has been, how, how could uh, the, uh, the most enlightened society that produced our civilization's greatest philosophers, poets, painters and composers, also produce its most notorious mass murderers and millions of people, citizens, who went along just to get along. In other words, was the Holocaust peculiar to the German government or are other enlightened societies capable as well? How about our own society?
Singer's message implied that we are all capable of oppressing others. Our own American sons and daughters dropped napalm and cluster bombs on civilian villages in the 1960s in Vietnam. And of course our best friends and dearest family members still subsidize animal atrocities every time they shop for food. The Nazis had an arbitrary social norm that said the Christian lives, the Jew dies. Our own society has translated this into our own social norm which says the dog lives, the pig dies. Only the victims' names have been changed to protect the architects of these social norms. Incidentally, for a brief commercial interruption, I'm going to be doing a workshop in a couple of hours in the other room on changing social norms. I hope that some of you can attend. End of commercial interruption. Some have accused me of devaluing the Holocaust by implying some analogy with our massive slaughter of animals. But fighting oppression is never about the identity or moral value of the victims. The analogies are about the oppressor's mindset and killing protocols. In fact, even our own perception of the victim's relative moral value is not really about their species, race, gender, or religion, but about our personal history and relationship with that victim. People will spend a small fortune taking care of their family dog, but not one cent to save the life of a starving child in Ethiopia or the Sudan. The key criterion for individuals becoming victims of oppression seems to be basically their vulnerability. Animals fit this criterion perfectly and are therefore the most oppressed, the most commonly oppressed victims. Human victims need to be vilified, dehumanized before they can be oppressed. And this is frequently done by conflating and identifying them with animals. But why do we oppress in the first place? Political and other social leaders and commercial interests oppress for political or financial gain. Our society sanctions oppression of animals in the interests of the meat and dairy industries. These sanctions then become ingrained in our social norms and allow any member of society to act accordingly with no punishment, no consequences of any kind. Individuals may oppress for their own reasons, for example, to gain control of the victim, as in the case of domestic violence or to see or to s take care of their inferiority complex perhaps by bullying other people. But even if people are unwilling to commit oppressive acts directly, they may be willing to subsidize others to do the job for them. When people purchase an animal product in a supermarket, they're basically saying, us, oh no, we would never think of committing murder, but uh, we're willing to hire some headmen to do it for us. Yeah. Oppression, like cancer, begins imperceptibly. Once it becomes part of the community's social norms, it is very difficult to eradicate. Even if people don't commit or subsidize oppression, most people will tolerate oppressive acts by their silence. This is why 
it's so important for us to be forever vigilant and refuse to be silent in the face of injustice. As As another Nobel laureate, Elie Wiesel, warned us, our silence favors the oppressor, never the victim. Ah, Well-meaning folks have challenged my decision to devote the rest of my life to opposing the use of animals for food. They understand why a Holocaust survivor would oppose oppression. But why animals? Why be concerned about animals when so many human problems remain unsolved? Has anybody else face this? Yeah. All right, why animals? Because animal oppression is the key to all forms of oppression. Animals are the most defenseless and therefore the most vulnerable and therefore the most oppressed sentient beings on earth. When oppressing animals become socially unacceptable, so will all other forms of oppression. Theologians have long debated whether there is life after death. When it comes to our oppression of animals, I wonder whether they have a life before death. Millions of male baby chicks are hatched and ground up alive or suffocated because they don't lay eggs. The females are crammed into small wire cages that tear out their feathers and cut into their feet. Mother pigs suffer in tight metal cages as their babies are torn from them and mutilated without anesthesia. Dairy cows are locked for life on a concrete floor. They cry for days for their babies who are torn from them at birth so that we can drink their milk. Why animals? Because oppressing animals is the gateway to oppressing humans. When we tell a child that the dog on his sofa is to be loved and cherished, but the pig on his plate is to be tortured, slaughtered, dismembered, cut up into small pieces and consumed as food. We are giving the child his very first social permission to discriminate between two like sentient beings. This It's the same sort of social permission that the Nazi children got that the Christian lives and the Jew dies. Why animals? Because they share our own feelings of joy, affection, sadness and grief. They can suffer just as you and I can. Many of us have experienced this firsthand with our own four-legged member of our family. Why animals? Because they are an integral part of our fondest childhood memories. Toy animals were the very first objects we handled as children. Our favorite ta fairy tales revolved around animal lives. Our family dog gave us unconditional love when our friends or even our own siblings would. It was only the greed and callousness of the meat and dairy industry 
that turned our favorite living beings into a commodity to be exploited and oppressed. Finally, why animals? Because we can. Because each year, each of us has the awesome power to spare 100 land and aquatic sentient beings just by choosing a diet that also happens to be better for our personal health and for the health of our planet. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have that kind of power to save human victims of oppression. The Holocaust has showed us the tragic consequences of unchecked oppression, where it can lead. When you dropped animals from your menu, you have taken your very first step on the long road to fighting oppression. Let's help our friends and neighbors to take that first step. Thank you. questions so if any of you have any questions for Alex I know that was um, incredibly moving would you like to just put your hands up and I'll come over to you on behalf of everyone when I say that was truly inspirational and you're an inspirational man. So as we've seen, very often we compare the Jewish Holocaust to the animal Holocaust and people go, you can't do that, you can't compare one with the other. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I basically gave the response as part of my presentation. I, the comparison is not about the victims. Uh, obviously, the Jewish people are very dear to me because I'm one of them. Uh, and uh, they matter to me a lot more than, than pigs do, just because I'm a human being. But uh, we're not comparing victims. We're comparing the mindset of, that permits people to oppress and we're comparing the protocols of oppression. That's what's comparable. In looking for a solution, we must not look to the victims. 
we must look to the oppressor and what makes it possible for people to oppress. And that's basically the lesson from the Holocaust. I think that I actually honor the Holocaust by trying to draw a lesson. Look at the alternative. The alternative is that this horrible tragedy has happened and we haven't learned anything from it. I'm over here by the door now. We're over here, Alex, on your right. Do you see me? I'm waving over here. Got it? Okay. Hi, Alex. Sorry, I'm really nervous. <laughs> um, I, I am too. <laughs> my family's um, is the same as yours. We came over from Austria in the Second World War, and my gran grandma and their kinder transport, and it has affected my family, sorry, so strongly for all this time. And I try to show my mother everything that you have said. Is there anything, one thing that you would show people who have your experiences? Is there any one thing that you would show them to help them understand? Thank you. It, the question was, if there was one thing or one piece of content or one fact or one figure, one thing that you could show people who come from a similar background to you to help them make the connection between the Holocaust and the animal Holocaust. Yeah, it's really very difficult. I, I don't normally talk about this uh, in my public life uh, because it requires, it basically requires a, a whole speech. It's not something that you can say to somebody in 30 seconds, it's not a sound bite. So I generally don't bring this up. But the, the, the key issue is that we're not, the, there is this tendency to, in, in, in dealing with oppression, we have this tendency of focusing on the victims. We have these special defense groups for every group of victims. And there is this almost a contest between the different victim groups as to whose sacrifice, whose oppression was more important than somebody else's oppression. And all of this focus on the victims is terribly counterproductive because it doesn't bring us any closer to answering the question of why do people oppress in the first place. Question. If you just put your hand up so I can see you, then I can come to you. Or anyone, anyone? Okay, I, okay. All right, this is, this is going to involve some legwork, maybe a bit of parkour, which by the way, I have no practice in, so this could go horribly wrong. Dun, dun, dun. I feel like I need like a theme tune for this bit. That was pretty easy, actually. Yes, thanks for, thanks for your presentation. As a German, I feel um, very like torn about comparing the Holocaust to anything because we've been told in school to, to never compare it to um, yeah, anything. And the official animal rights march, for example, prohibited to use any signs of uh, Holocaust comparisons for animal rights uh, reasons. Um, do you think that in a country with such a sensitive history, maybe we should s still stay away from that comparison because it's counterproductive? Right. Uh, that, yeah, the, it's a very valid question. It's one that we've been struggling with. But uh, um, the, 
I mean, we, we need to do something dramatic to get people to listen to our message. Uh, if, we, if we could find a less dramatic way of doing that, we probably would, but uh, we haven't so far. So we have, some of us have been spreading that message in Germany and uh, we feel very badly about hurting people's feelings but we're also aware that we don't have any other way of breaking through this in insensitivity to the slaughter of millions of sentient animals that's going on in Germany and everywhere else. Questions? If people just stand up or raise their hands so that I can see. It. Okay, I'm going back. <laughs> Hopefully, John Venus is watching this and knows that I'm doing my movement for the day. Hello. In the animal rights movement, I have encountered. Holocaust deniers and very ugly people. I wonder if you have encountered yourself people like this. Uh, the far right are in the animal rights movement as well. I wonder if you've encountered people like this. So the, the question is if you have encountered um, Holocaust deniers in your... No. No. I have. There are such people. I mean, people think the animal rights movement uh, are all fantastic people. And, you know, most of us are, but there certainly are some ugly people who are literally Holocaust deniers and the far right. I have not run into this in the 40 years that I've been active in the United States. I'm moving over this way. Sorry. Hi, thanks for your beautiful speech. Um, Thank you. I just wanted to say that uh, from what you've seen over the years, do you feel like a vegan future is possible and has your perspective on that changed in recent years and how do you feel, do you believe that the future is vegan from what you've seen? Uh, the vegan future is not only possible, it's inevitable. Uh, and it's going to happen because of the cooperation between the people in this room on one hand and the people who run the meat and dairy industries on the other. The, those folks are beginning to realize that their future profits lie with plant-based meats and milks and uh, that's why the future will be vegan. I'll come over to you. Oh, this is fun. I'll go there. Don't worry, you'll come over. Uh, thank you for your speech. Sure, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, what is, do you think, what do you think is the most effective form of activism? Ah, <clears throat> I didn't pay this lady to ask this question. <laughs> but uh, the answer will be in about two hours in the other building.
Thank you all very much.